My name is Nancy Wen. I'm Vice President of the Asia Foundation here in Washington. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, the Asia Foundation is a private nonprofit organization that works on governance, development, economic issues in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, we just celebrated our 60th anniversary last year, so we've been in and around the region for a long time. One of the areas that we've become particularly interested in lately is the information technology area and how that can be harnessed for development purposes. My colleague John Carr um, and his colleagues from the field will be talking a little bit about some programming that we have done uh, in Indonesia and Myanmar that might be of interest to you, as well as some of the issues surrounding the use of technology in development. So I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. <coughs> I'm, I'm John. Uh, John Carr. I'm based in our San Francisco office, uh, which is the headquarters of the Asia Foundation. And my work focuses on technology initiatives and how we can better use ICT tools to integrate them into our ongoing programs, um, to enhance them, to make them more impactful, to scale them more effectively. So that's kind of the focus of my work. And as part of that, um, one of the big challenges that we face every day is how can we attract the best uh, developers in the, in the local communities where we work? You know, how can we uh, make it easier for top talent in uh, technology fields in Asia to really play a meaningful role in development efforts as opposed to sometimes coming into, into work contexts where they're their role isn't really very well defined and they, they don't really know what to do and they don't really have the tools to uh, make the kind of impact they could if, if their hosts, the international organizations like the Asia Foundation were, were just a little bit better prepared. So I think that's one of the topics that we want to address in this presentation. But we're really lucky to have um, two very talented uh, software developers from the region uh, who have worked with me in the past on projects that the Asia Foundation has implemented. We have Johan Toting from Indonesia. And Johan is sort of the lead developer outreach uh, team member at the Asia Foundation. He's worked with me on a number of different projects across the region. He's a Google developer expert in Asia. And he's also the, the founder of uh, Makerspace, which was the first kind of co-working space in Indonesia for you know, software developers for creative types, for the creative class in uh, Bandung. Uh, but we also have Yelenong. Uh, and Yelenong is a very talented developer who we've just been working with recently in Myanmar. Uh, he's a software engineer. He works for a company called Zwinexis. Um, and he's also been the community manager for a program that the Asia Foundation has been doing in Myanmar called Let's Vote or Me Peso uh, Myanmar. So I thought we would just, you know, I'm going to try and set the stage a little bit, go really quickly through some, some slides, talk a little bit about the Asia Foundation and how we work, uh, and then try to open, open this up to our guests so that they can talk to you a little bit about, you know, things that they think are important for international development organizations when they're thinking about doing, you know, really technology pro programs that have a, a very significant piece of tech built into them. So the Asia Foundation has been sort of redoubling our efforts in the last few years um, doing tech-related uh, programming. Um, we focus on three key areas. I call them mobile, social, and data. Uh, those are really the general broad areas of innovation we think are most exciting, enable, enabling access to information through mobile devices, improving analysis and learning for our partners and the groups that we work with in the region. That's data and analytics. And then software tools like social, social platforms like Facebook, Twitter, but also GitHub, other distributed mechanisms for people to work together in new and creative ways, and that's kind of collaboration. And so, you know, we kind of think of this as a cross-cutting approach, which, you know, we look for opportunities to use these tools in all the programs in which we work. Whoops, and we did, we did put a handout that has a map and uh, it's on the back page and there's a kind of a sampling of some of the work that we do across the region, different types of projects that you might find interesting uh, and I can, I'm happy to talk more about them if you have questions. Uh, but you know, we work across the region. Nepal on migrant uh, worker issues. In Sri Lanka we're doing digital payments projects. 
Myanmar, we've just done a big election program, and, and the election is just a couple of weeks away. Uh, and some really interesting programs in Indonesia, which uh, Johan will talk about. But the thing, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to try to go quick. But why are we so excited about uh, tech in Asia? Well, there's lots of opportunities, and they're only growing. Uh, unique subscribers of mobile SIM cards. These are people, individuals who have mobile devices that are connected, are growing rapidly, and we expect in the, by 2020 to roughly see 500 to six to possibly 700 million additional users uh, who are connected in new and really intriguing ways in the region, and they're enabled by a growing uh, telecommunications infrastructure that's expanding and rapidly transitioning to uh, broadband. So that's what's really key here is that as the price for smartphones come down, uh, and they are really reaching parity with feature phones in the region. A lot of white box smartphones from, from China are in the hands of, of people who are kind of trading off their feature phones for s smart devices that they can connect to data networks. And when you're connected to a data network, you're connected to the internet. And this is for, the, for many people, this is the first time they've ever been able to engage in this way. And so that's such an incredible trend going into 2020 that we think it's really important. It's creating a whole, a creative class of people that we really want to work with. Um, and this is a, a picture from a hackathon that we supported in Indonesia, in Bandung. You can see, it's just evident that there's a, there's a group of people out there who are, who are working, who are really engaged on the technology front. They, these are all software developers working at a hackathon for the Asia Foundation sponsored. Um, but, again, Asia is booming. The technology sector is probably the, the most impressive sector in the region at the moment, and so there is a problem. The problem is demand for talent. It's really very difficult to uh, recruit talent in Silicon Valley. I know that. That's where I'm based. Uh, but if you go to the region, it's the same. It's the same for a class of developers who are using the, to the modern tools for building for the web, building for the modern web. This is different from a class of technologists that maybe have skills from a skill set from about 10 years ago. How they build for the web and how they build for scale and how they build for expanding quickly the applications that they're building. They're more flexible, they're cheaper, and they're more informed by things like the cloud. So how do we get to these, these folks? Um, it's really difficult. So the, the thing that we really think about is, well, how can we make these opportunities for them to collaborate with us as productive as possible? How can we prepare the way for them? Uh, and so there are three areas that we think we really try to invest, invest in to, again, sort of make it easier for top talent to kind of play a meaningful role in the work that we do. And what I mean by meaningful is we want them to come in and be really productive. So we focus on um, a couple of areas. I'm going to talk about one and, and just introduce it, and then I, we're going to try and talk about the other two as we go through this process. But the first one for us is this issue of data and curation of data and making it accessible to developers because the data that we're talking about as international development professionals is often data sets that, you know, there is no real kind of, there isn't really a hidden hand that is going to move those data sets into machine-readable format into a, into a way, a format that uh, application developers can really get at. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, we worked in Indonesia for the election in 2014 with the election commission there, which had pr 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 produced information on candidates that they had uh, encoded in PDF documents. So there's something like 30,000 candidates in the 2014 election at the, at the national and provincial level. And so in order to get information on candidates, you have to sort through PDF documents. And as you know, they're not really searchable. They're not cl classically machine readable. And it's impossible to extract any meaning from these documents. It's very hard to read them on mobile phones. You can't use them to build applications. They're just there. So what do we mean by curating, hosting, and interface? Well, we extracted the content from those PDF documents, all 30,000 candidate bios, data of all stripes, and structured it, injected it into a database that lived in the cloud, and then built on top of that database an
interface that software developers could get at so that they could grab that data. They could grab all of the data on candidates for the election and build applications that integrated information on candidates and made it searchable, made it interactive on mobile devices. So again, this idea of building a platform of data is one of the things that we really focus on. Um, but I, I list all of the various different types of data that we think are important and that oftentimes need an international organization to kind of come in and help curate. Because again, if you're trying to pave the way for software developers, they're, they're not necessarily uh, expert in any of these issue areas, and they shouldn't be. They're expert at building software that can parse this data, that can analyze this data, that can make it more interactive, more compelling for users. Maybe our job is to curate in new ways this kind of information and make it more accessible to software developers. So, you know, I, again, I, I focus on two areas when I'm working in this space. One is kind of providing data structure, extracting information, getting it into databases that are usable for software developers, and then providing that interface for these guys so that they can come in quickly in a matter of days, build a very simple uh, mobile application because they don't have to do the heavy lifting of data, grabbing, structuring, analyzing. And that's not their job. That's not their area of expertise. So we need to think about where we can create the space for them to come in and be very productive. This is one of the things that we focus on. Uh, so our approach uh, is really focused on this because we, these databases can power many apps. So if you have the right kind of data sets, in the case of the Indonesia election, many applications can be built using that single database. So you can go to scale in uh, any number of ways and you can expand your reach in any, num any number of ways by, by building many applications and services on top of a single well curated and well structured uh, database. Um, and that's kind of, again, that, that one area that I think is really important. I think there are a couple of others. One is this idea of research uh, and analysis that can be done to support uh, the work of software developers. Um, that oftentimes it doesn't get done. Surveys on users, uh, co collecting valuable information that they can use to build uh, the tools that we're asking them to build. And then also helping them collaborate more with organizations, groups, governments that they don't normally uh, talk to a lot. And so I'm going to try to wrap it up and hand it over to, to our guests. And hopefully they can explain a little bit more about how they think we should be working with them. Yeah. Um. When the ASA Foundation come to me in Indonesia, uh, actually I'm running my community already since 2010. And Michelle and Thomas, uh, the team from ASA Foundation, coming to Bandung and meet with me when we have an event in Bandung in our co-working space. So they're coming to me and asking, like, uh, we planning to do the hackathon to helping the election and build apps on top of our database. And I asked like, how you can do this kind of things? Because for us as a del developers, it's very hard to get the data. Deal with, dev uh, with the government is a very big deal for us. It's kind of like a something that we're trying to avoid. So we are as the community, the community that I mentioned here is a researcher, observer, developers, designers, open data enthusiasts. We are very, happy to help but sometimes we doesn't know how to help so this is the community that we work in indonesia so my community is a uh, foa forum web anak bandung it's basically like uh, the co creative community who work on internet like uh, developers bloggers social media designers and we work also with others community from uh, different cities in indonesia and Partnership with them with will make us able to do the hackathon and help us uh, to invite all the developers coming to join with us and build the apps to solving one problem. 
bridging the gap between information from the government into the voters in Indonesia. So this is actually uh, how the process usually the developers will do when we build the apps. This is the, uh, if you're familiar with design thinking, this is what we use, uh, the methodology that we use in developer, Google developer community, Google design sprint. So if you see the first space, understanding the problem, like uh, now the data that we have, who the stakeholder, what the user story, the process behind and everything, it's the most important phase before we start other phase in develop and apps. And this is the things that we are as a developer, sometimes we cannot do by ourselves because getting the data, for example, from government is very hard to do for us. So that's why we need the partners as a, like a helping us get the data, helping us to understand the problem, helping us to figure out what actually we need to solve. Because we only know how to craft the code and building apps. So we need help in this process to able to understand everything so we can build the right solution for the right problem. And if you see what we do in Indonesia, especially for our election apps, this is a collect the data and understanding the problem is the first space that we need before we build the apps in Hackathon. So collect the data, the ASA Foundation working with the election commission to get the data. And we're helping also to understand the developers what actually the problem that voters have by working together with NGO to do the research and get the insights what kind of uh, needs from the voters. Probably they will come in with the insight like, uh, oh, I need to know uh, where this polling station, for example. But for example, in Myanmar, we actually, oh, sorry, in Indonesia, actually, we doesn't need to know where the polling station because we know already, uh, we have already couple election before when we know where our polling station actually. So the NGO come, the Asia Foundation come with the good insight, like uh, actually the voters need more insight about who the candidates. Because usually as a voters, I only know my candidates when I come into polling station, like uh, 10 minutes before I do the vote. That's why we need to help the voters to get information about the candidates before they go to the voting station. So this process we're helping, the red color is the part where we need to help the developers. And the build apps is part of the developers, which means here we're doing the hackathon. And also promote the, the distribute the apps is very challenging part for us because we understand how to build the app, but we're not the marketing people. So the Asia Foundation, the NGO also working together with the partners. So we in Indonesia, we're working with Google, we're working with media partners like uh, online media, blog. Even Indonesia is a very uh, popular with uh, social media country. Like uh, we are the third country in Facebook users. We are the third country also in Twitter. So we're working to help developers promote the apps. So to make sure the apps that they build will uh, reach the voters that need this application. And besides we helping the developers to build the apps, this is also uh, one important thing that we can get when we deal with the developers. So if we're talking about the open data, getting the data from the government is very challenging part. Especially in Indonesia, if you're coming to the government and asking like, uh, can we get this kind of data and can you open uh, your data, even we already have the policy to open the data from the government, but it's like give them another effort to publish the data because a lot of data actually still in paper. So if like give another work for them to digitize and open the data. So this is sample of the data that we got in Myanmar, uh, still running till now. So if you see, for example, that in Myanmar, when people access the information in election, you can see that Android browsers and Chrome and Safari is actually top three uh, browsers. It means that Android browsers and Chrome is very popular device in Myanmar. You can compare Safari is from iOS. So you can see like uh, how, like uh, what kind of a users, what kind of device we have in Myanmar using this kind of data. 
So what we are thinking is actually, if you want to get the data, don't come to the government and ask them to give you the data. But we need to help the government build a solution for them so they can use. But actually, when we when they use the solution, actually it's also generate the new data. So it's not like a give them another effort to generate the data, like a digitize the data from paper to a database, but we're helping them to solve the problem, but actually we also generate the new data. And we, we let us know, uh, we let them know that we're helping them and we get the data so we can solve more problem. And also what we're doing in Indonesia uh, is the first civic hack. We previously we already have uh, a lot of hackathons before, but this is the first civic hack we have in Indonesia that working with government and solving the problem that we have uh, in our country. And after our first hackathon, we have a lot of uh, another hackathon in Indonesia. This is our first hackathon. It's happening in uh, 8 and 9 March of uh, 2014 in Bandung. And after this, we got from Pulse Lab to NDP uh, another hackathon to helping the public service in Indonesia. And this is also the city hackathon supported by the mayor, Ahok. So they're also running the hackathon to solve the problem in Jakarta, our capital. And this is uh, actually like a happening like a, a month ago or two months ago with our president. So they have a, a hackathon in president's staff office and the winners have a chance to meet with the presidents to talk about what kind of apps they build. And what we, what we are thinking is actually, we need to show to the developers, like uh, you can contribute to solve your problem in your country, but we need to show the way and we need to help them also to able build the apps. Means like a helping them get the data, helping them also distribute the application. And this is we our next hackathon will happening uh, next week. Sorry, in the next two days, it's actually will happening in twenty eight cities around Indonesia, and we already got more than one thousand participants for this hackathon. It's kind of like uh, we trying to solve a very big uh, problem in around the country. So what I'm thinking is. People really, really want to help, like a developers really contribute to solve the problems, but we need to giving them a way to do these things. So what we, do, we got in Indonesia is actually we got more than 100 million requests, and this is actually the first cloud-based election information system, and we got 40 apps published and people can use. And also, all the apps is very easy to access. We have a uh, web, we have uh, iOS, we have Android, even we have also the Windows Phone. And we got seven million unique users in our uh, that use our database. To get the da all the application, we publish all the apps into one website. So it's kind of like an app store, but for the election apps. So we publish under our pemiluapps.org, which Pemilu actually election in Bahasa Indonesia. So we have uh, 40 apps uh, inside this website, so you can just open and access there. And now it's actually we planning another hackathon in Indonesia because we have a local election to select our uh, mayor in our uh, different, like a district or in city. And this is will be uh, learning opportunities that we got actually from Myanmar because these things still happening in Myanmar. They will have their elections in next two weeks. And I will pass this uh, to Yelinang, my college in Myanmar, as a community manager of our My Peso. So, uh, 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 thanks, Johan. Uh, so what we do was uh, is usually the same as the initial. So we did we try to uh, get the information out of the 
the Union Election Commission from Myanmar, and then we try to make it usable and uh, for the developers. And we, we make the uh, two weeks uh, hack challenge. Uh, we invite everyone from the tech community, and so they participate. They make their applications, and so it ended like two weeks ago. And we are now in the stage of uh, distributing the applications, getting the applications out out into the people's hands. So uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to say uh, this is a very fast hackathon in our country with the provided data. We have done some hackathon in our country before, but this is a very, very fast uh, experience. Especially we have some difficulties because uh, because we are afraid that people, not people might not have the experience working with the uh, latest tools and technologies and the API and stuff like that. But to our surprise, uh, a lot of people participated and we see uh, very good quality applications. And so uh, what we really wanted to do is that we encourage them to build the applications for the uh, our local people. Uh, we don't really need a, a lot of features, but the complicated stuff. We only need uh, some very simple, solid features and very usable. So that's why we did like a two weeks uh, events rather than some sort of four days our hackathons or stuff like that because we really want something uh, very close to the uh, complete product because we, because uh, we, we we are gonna roll out these applications to the real people and then see uh, how people use this and stuff like that and another thing is that uh, this is uh, open to everyone so we invite everyone as, as students and the local tech community even people from abroad they participate in the in our hack challenge uh, it's because it's a two weeks event and yeah, and another interesting thing is that uh, it's just kind of a, a generation, generational thing because uh, some people who participated in our events, uh, they are pretty young, like 18 or uh, like some of them are like 17 years old, students from the university. They might not have a chance to vote, but they participated and they, w they wanted to help the people getting the information like how to vote and how who, sh who sh they should vote and stuff like that. So this is a uh, kind of very interesting, and we can say this is a very good thing for our country. So uh, what we did was that we tried to get the information out of the the UEC, like I said before, and we put everything on the GitHub. Is the the data, the data set, the API, and everything is out in the open. Uh, we uh, provide support very responsively to the feedback set, and then we work very closely with the community. And then uh, this is uh, the collaboration that uh, we see that's happening in the during the two weeks of the event because uh, uh, we see a lot of new faces, yeah, not even uh, that we never seen before in the community uh, because uh, a lot of people, uh, we try to spread it, the news to everyone as much as possible, especially the, the universities, also uh, the local tech uh, industries, uh, local software industries, that uh, the people they we n we never met them before. They came out and they uh, start working on the apps that they have the idea. And uh, we use some uh, modern technologies such as like Slack. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. Uh, it's a cloud-based uh, collaboration tools. Uh, so we invite everyone, every participants to the Slack. Uh, but we, which which is uh, what really is a kind of a channel uh, to interact each other is a kind of a uh, messaging platform and we interact with uh, our Mapizo team and the, the participants. We try to, they ask the questions about the, our API and they ask the questions about the election process and we try to answer and we try to support them as much as we can. Also they try to uh, report uh, some errors in our API and some errors in our data like some of the can photos of the candidates are wrong and stuff like that and so we try to fix it very immediately and try to give it a uh, uh, support as much as we can. So this is uh, this is some of the statistics uh, over the uh, hack challenge, and so uh, there are like uh, 170 uh, members in our Slack channels, and this is a kind of a new uh, way of collaboration because uh, in the past people have to come be in the one room and they have to talk and sort things over, but now today uh, we don't really have to meet in person. We can do it online remotely, and it's a kind of a uh, distributed collaboration as uh, we we'll see things are happening. So uh, right now what we're really doing is uh, uh, lots of ongoing activities uh, such as uh, we're trying to rolling out the applications into the people hand. Uh, as, uh, as I said before, uh, 
we are continuing working with the union election committee. We, we report them what we did and we show them the applications and uh, they are quite happy with uh, what we are doing. So they, uh, they promote our application and initiative on their Facebook page. And then and other things that uh, we are distributing that distributing the applications via SMS, like uh, bless the SMS across the whole country uh, with the uh, link to the initiative and the website so that people can uh, browse the applications and download it and stuff like that. And another thing is that uh, if, uh, if you have seen it before, uh, our country uses Facebook a lot and a lot of people do a lot of stuff on the Facebook and we are trying to promote a lot of things uh, on the Facebook, especially the apps and the apps they are individually promoting themselves. Also, we are also trying to help promoting uh, as an initiative. And another thing is that we are also in the meantime uh, trying to fix the encoded data uh, because the apps are already in the people hand and people, some people they really use it and they want to report some errors. So they report it to the applications or they report directly to us and we are fixing it in the meantime. So another thing is that uh, we are trying to encourage, uh, engage with the media, trying to get the uh, roll out the applications to the people hand as much as we can. So, yes, uh, that's uh, pretty much best. I'm up to it. Yeah. Yeah, Rong, thank you, uh, Johan. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask our team, um, but maybe I could ask the first question. Um, Yelenong, you mentioned your work with the UEC, and I was wondering if you could talk about, maybe give us a perspective on maybe what it was like a couple of years ago, and what it's like now when you think about the collaboration opportunities with the government, what the relationship is, how, how, it's, in, how it's evolved, and wh yeah. wh where you guys are today. Yeah, so if we talk about like, uh, we will do this kind of stuff, uh, with the government, like in the past five years ago, then we might nobody might believe it because uh, back in the days things are very strict, and we might not say anything bad things about the governments. They will come and get you after if we say something bad. But now today things are pretty open. Uh, but the thing is that the government, as much as we see, is that they don't have the the capacity and the resource and the knowledge to do this kind of stuff. And so this is where the issue of foundation payment uh, connect with the developers and the government to get the information out of the government and uh, make it very uh, usable and make it a transformation and uh, you for the developers. Actually, this is the uh, kind of uh, the, hard, the hard part of the, the process, the whole process, because uh, the data uh, that the UEC gave us is that uh, the paperwork, is a, the, some of them are not, it's a handwritten paper, some are scanned paper, and we try to make it digitized, and it's a very hard process, but we we try very hard to make it uh, usable as uh, as less as errors that can be, and so the developers can use this uh, with the uh, it's very smoothly and stuff like that. So yeah, is that this is a very very fast uh, initiative. We work with the government, yeah, and I think we uh, really hope to work with them more in the future. Yeah, well, thanks, sir. Uh, we have a microphone, and if everyone could speak into the mic, I guess we're uh, streaming this, so, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I think maybe your mic's not on. I'm not sure if your mic is on. Maybe we can get that fixed for you. It's a little technical issue here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll just repeat myself. Uh, Bill Jorn, ROI3. Uh, it's a startup, uh, and uh, we're creating apps for the developing and emerging countries and economies. And uh, we've not thought about uh, in an active sense, getting into the, let's say, the public, uh, too many public areas, uh, like elections and so forth. But is uh, on the, uh, I, I'd like to ask this question of both of you. Are your efforts going to result in 
uh, either directly or indirectly uh, commercializing or monetizing uh, these apps as they're developed um, uh, in the areas that you've described or other areas. You're one of the things that is pretty clear to me is that you're developing a tremendous uh, capability of people in those countries to create apps as part of their lives. Okay. Okay, uh, maybe if we think like uh, to monetize the app, it's very dependent on the apps that we build. So if we're talking about the election app, it means we need to uh, give access to everyone uh, without any limit. So by release the app in the paid person, it means like uh, we, we set the limit to the people to get the access to the information. But we are also thinking, if we're talking about the civic hack, uh, building apps for, for the people, we realize that there's an issue uh, about sustainability when we building the apps, this kind of app. But I think the first important things when we build something, it's solving the problem. And helping people to get access and use it is the first important things that we need to understand, th that we need to to do first before we're talking about how we can make this uh, sustainability. Because if we're not able to solve it first, I don't want to think about any business side because it will distract us. So uh, it's easier for us as a developer thinking about what the solution that we need to build before we think the business. So in Indonesia, uh, if we're talking about election, of course, we need to release everything for free. And because we put everything open source, so even other developers want to build uh, other solution based on our solution, they can just pull the source code and build uh, on top of it uh, for free. Because the reason for open source everything is means like uh, to keep uh, the solution better. So instead of we work in the closed source, we keep uh, all the source code just for us. It's better to share the knowledge for everyone so everyone can learn from our things and they can maybe they can build better solution for others. Uh, maybe Yelena wanna add more. Uh, so in our country, it's a little bit different because uh, uh, only like two years ago, we started to things are opening out like with the rollout of the new SIM cards and new telcos. So more pe people are having more access, uh, access to the, the 3G and the internet. But the thing is that uh, through our my personal experience and the other things that we still are not able to monetize the applications uh, because we don't have the re very reliable payment system and this is uh, not the kind of stuff that uh, individual companies can do. So we are not uh, very focusing on monetizing the, the public by in terms of the applications. But in the other way is that uh, we can also work with the business to business kind of stuff like uh, uh, giving the some funds to the application, uh, sorry, to the company to develop the apps. And that's the kind of stuff we want we we can do in terms of uh, monetizing the stuff. But I agree that uh, in the long term we want to do something good, and uh, so we need a we need a uh, we need to be sustainable, and and we need the money to uh, run in the long term. So uh, it might not be it might not it be in a way that uh, we charge the the public directly, but in a way that uh, like advertisement or promotion or uh, getting sponsor or stuff like that. So yes, the, the, that that might be the case in our country. Yeah. Maybe I can add something to that. Uh, we do have a kind of open API approach, which is our APIs that we publish uh, are open and free for people to use in any way they would like. However, if you participate in one of our hackathons or our competitions that are incentivized by prize, then your app must be free. That's one of, I think, the rules. <laughs> But we let people run ads in their apps, and if they if they want to try to do some kind of uh, advertising-based uh, monetization scheme, that's fine with us as long as you're not charging 
citizens to use the app that are developed as part of our hackathons, which have prizes and all kinds of cool things like that. Josh. Hi, my name is Joshua Haynes. I'm from the U US Agency for International Development. Can you help us understand a little bit about the, develop the developer's environment in your respective countries? Where did you learn how to code? How many, um, what's the coding situation? Like, is there a dearth? Uh, how many of your colleagues are female coders? Um, et cetera, because it's, it's, we always, we know a lot about what's happening in civil society. We always know a lot about what's happening um, in government. But w we're building, bringing the developers in, in, the, in the room. It's great to understand what and what, what would ideally you need to have a better developer environment. Thanks. In Indonesia, uh, we very understand that there's a gap between our uh, graduate people who graduated from university and the developers that we need in our industry. So uh, myself starting to code since the high school because I'm curious about the game that I play, the website that I access, and I really, really want to build by myself. So I think most of the developers in Indonesia is mostly uh, learned by, by themselves by using any research they found in internet or, or using the books they buy in the bookshops. Uh, because we understand that university actually not giving us enough uh, knowledge to able make us uh, good developers. So now in Indonesia, we have problem with talents because a lot of startups coming from around the world, even Malaysia, Singapore, Japan, even from US also, coming to Indonesia to get our talents because the salary level compared with this country is very different. And a lot of developers, uh, of course, uh, they need money, so they prefer to get more payment on it. So uh, we, as a the community, it's actually, uh, it's, it's a problem, but for us, it's a good thing because more developers we need to ge generate. So what, what we are doing now is uh, we in the community actively do the workshop, seminars, go into the university, teach the uh, latest technology that y they need to learn, and also, uh, I think a lot of uh, companies also coming to Indonesia and trying to to teach this. For example, me uh, working closely with the Google uh, because I'm part of the Google Developer Expert Program. So we do a lot of workshop to make people uh, able to code in the latest stack that we need in, in our industry. And if you mentioned about the gender equality in our industry, uh, I think from 10 developers, maybe you only find one or two. Uh, but we have uh, Indonesia, we have uh, ID Geek Girls, which is Indonesia Geek Girls community. Maybe they're not really, really uh, programmers, but they're working in the our industry. Uh, or even in Myanmar also, they have uh, their own Geek Girls. So I think in Indonesia, developers, now, uh, for ourselves, I think we have a lot of developers, but because the demand also is very high, so we still lack of developers, but we're working on it to generate more talents. Uh, so uh, how I got started is that I also learned uh, something uh, to myself, and then actually I have to uh, go against some of my parents and some of my uh, relatives because I wanted to be a programmer and they, they don't understand uh, you want to be a programmer <laughs> and then they don't understand uh, how I make a living with the computers and stuff like that because in our country as you know like doctors or engineers or those are those are the kind of stuff that they are very fond of and like computer designer and stuff like that they are not they don't see because we don't really have the success story of the something to do with the computer. But uh, back back in the days, it was very uh, struggling and uh, internet was very slow. And we we try very hard for it. But then now today things are pretty good, I can say. And so uh, we also have the uh, the problem with the uh, the female developers. Actually, is it's not the case that there are not 
a lot of female developers. There are a lot of female developers because if you go to the the, to the computer university, the the ratio is like uh, eighty uh, percent of the students is are the the female students. But the the reason is that the thing is that after they graduate, they didn't become a software engineer or programmer because uh, they are not very passionate or very interested in the in the computer programming uh, like uh, we do. So they want to work with the other industry, uh, but although they have the the computer degree and stuff like that, but uh, so another thing is that uh, we have a kind of a two different industry, even in our own tech industry, is that one of them is a, a very a very normal. They go to work a nine to five. They come back. Uh, they they don't uh, work on any side projects or anything anymore. But they are they they call themselves a software engineer. But we are kind of different. Uh, we we work on uh twenty four hour twenty four seven. And the only difference between for uh, between the weekdays and week weekends are that in the weekdays we work for the companies and weekend we work for ourselves and it's a kind of the kind of the life that uh, it's a two kind of ends in the even our technology but right now what we are trying to do is that we try to get uh, some people out of the other industry get into our industry by doing some workshop boot camps and stuff like that so that we can meet the new people and also uh, there are now today the demand the software talent demand is uh is a uh, very demanding uh there are not a lot of companies who can do mobile development in our country because and uh, and so there are a lot of opportunities but uh, the talent is not there i mean even we don't really need the very very good people we need a uh, better the average uh people to do the lots of stuff so uh that's a kind of we are but we are we are kind of struggling but uh we in the meantime we are trying very hard to get a lot of people into the, uh, to do more, uh, and and let them know that they can do more stuff like that. Yeah. Hi, uh, Jacob Vader from FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, thank you both very much for your time and presentations today. Um, I have a younger brother who's studying computer science right now in Massachusetts and uh, doesn't want to work in the U.S. So maybe I'll suggest to him that he goes to. Uh, Indonesia or Myanmar for his job. Uh, uh, my question is about the distribution of the apps. Um, in your previous slide, you showed that uh, you use Facebook and uh, Google Play and work with the um, election commission to distribute. And that's uh, dis dis distributed via SMS. But when I think of SMS, I think of text messaging. So is that what it is? And could you just describe kind of the detailed um, uh, process of how people download them and then the strategy that you use with the commission and Facebook and Google. Thank you. Uh, so we, we, we send the SMS uh, saying that uh, if you want to know some applications about the elections, go to this link and we put the, the link of the websites. And then in on the websites, we have a kind of a showcase of the applications like uh, it's, it's uh, sorted by the winners and then other people. So the people download the applications. Uh, we are also, in the meantime, uh, see the analytics of the uh, uh, statuses of the, the websites, like uh, how, how many people click the download link, how many people click the uh, Google Play link and stuff like that. So every time they send the SMS, uh, we can see that it's a very high uh, gem in the our statistics analytics stuff. So uh, this is kind of working. And then the other things about Facebook is that we try to encourage people to share the news about them so that uh, a lot of people will use it and so this is a kind of more uh, organic stuff uh, in the meantime we do we also some kind of uh to uh promoting the promoting their posts on the facebook line spending some money on it but uh, but this uh, this is a kind of part and other things that yeah uh, we encourage the people to share about talk about the stuff and they really like it we we see that uh, people really like it and they encourage because uh, in the m in the past uh, they never seen those kind of stuff before. This is the very first thing we do those kind of uh, politic stuff with the technology, and uh, so people are very surprised and they they want more like uh, they want to add this feature and they want like they were they were asking like uh, when is the iOS version is coming out and when is the uh, when can we see the uh, the new updates or can you can you add these features and so this is a uh, very interesting. Uh, I think in Indonesia we we try different approach because uh, we know Indonesia is a 
social media country uh, a lot of people paying social media especially in Twitter and also in Facebook uh, in Indonesia we have uh, like a Twitter celebrity so this is like Twitter user who have uh, followers more than 10,000 so so I very close with this uh, people and there are a lot of them and so we working with them to help us uh, distribute our apps so we do the same thing like in Myanmar we put everything our apps in one website so we just need to share uh, one link about the apps so we we not pay the this Twitter celebrity even usually they get paid for example uh, they can get like a 200 only for 200 bucks for 10 tweets but they do for us uh, for free because they know this is a uh, for our country for our election so they create a campaign uh, they have kind of a community this community is a create a campaign using specific hashtag for example we using a code for food so they create the conversation in Twitter with uh, between them and then their follower retweet and it's spreading out and until we we reach the trending topic so that's that's how we use a uh, Twitter to 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 blast the information that we need but of course we we do also our uh, things to distribute like uh, working with our media partners with television uh, newspaper uh, also online media so that's all we what we do in distributing the apps and if you'd like to see the uh, what is actually SMSed out to everyone in Myanmar twice a week, all the way up until the election day, just go to maypeso.org. That's M-A-E-P-A-Y-S-O-H dot org. That's uh, Let's Vote. Um, and you'll see what everyone else will see when they get that uh, message. Yes, this is the uh, desktop version. This is the mobile version. This is the three winners from our uh, hack challenge in Myanmar, but we have uh, everything here in our showcase. So this is all the apps that we got so far. So we uh, actually we got 15 apps in our election, but they haven't finished the app, so they need to publish it here. I'm Yuhi from Myanmar. I'm coming for the Nidan Fellowship. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate to the our young people who developed for this Mapizod application. And I would like to know is there are a lot of mistakes of the voting list in Myanmar. So this uh, the UEC said they they got a lot of um, uh, funding. From the uh, from the ADB for to using this uh, to using for the voting voting list, but they 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 did so many mistakes and they said uh, last uh, last last new I I heard that the chairman of UEC he uh, he blamed to the to the software software company because of the software company they have a lot of mistake for the listing so why don't they uh, why don't they uh, run this kind of like I good I IT developer or they can can they blame the, the software software company? Actually, they can also use the the Sensex Sensex leaks. It can be made more uh, more less uh, less mistake. I think. So, how do you uh, how do you think about the software? It is can we can blame the software company or because of because of the UEC staff mistake. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a, I think it, I'm not very sure about how things uh, work with the, the UEC and the and the company who work for the voter list because uh, uh, we we the voter list is part of the members of initiative, but we did not work with the uh, we did not work on the, the voter list because we only work on the, the candidates and the parties and the, uh, the other 
stuff. Uh, we the voter list is is, is a work uh, is done by a different company and in the UEC themselves. But uh, what I what I think is that uh, there needs to be a, a process of the uh, quality control because uh, because that if you s if you look at the the, the two process that uh, when they release uh, the voter list that who is eligible to vote and your information and your particulars like NRNC, your parents' name, uh, they might be wrong because uh, because it might be some error and stuff like that. But uh, what actually uh, happened is that you have to go to the your neighborhood and check the your particulars and you get the people to fix it in your local uh, election committee and then they try to compile it into a list and then they try to upload in into the uh, the voter list the website and the API. And so this two things is like uh, it's not in happening in the same time. It might be it might take some time to sync, I think, but I'm not very sure. But uh, they say that they are uh, trying to update the voter list days by days and uh, getting the error fixed. But but right now I think is that uh, the voter list is kind of uh, kind of obsolete because uh, the day to uh, fix the error and the thing is uh, over and then even the, the voting day is kind of uh, quite close uh, so but uh, I think we can learn a lot of stuff from uh, this because uh, it's not very easy to get the whole uh, the voter list online because we we know it because uh, we uh, we even we have a lot of difficulties even when we work on the candidates because uh, the voter list voter list is much larger than the, the candidates. We have the candidates like less than 5,000, but the, the voters is like millions of people. And so there definitely will be mistakes. And I think uh, what really happened is uh, they need uh, they need more better uh, the quality and control. So yeah, so that's uh, kind of what happened, I think. Yeah, but I'm not very sure about uh, what actually happened. Yeah, because uh, we did not really rely on the voter list as uh, for the initiative. Hi, Anand Varghese from um, Development Alternatives International. Um, a question for really anybody, but perhaps for John. W what were the specific mechanisms that you used to clean up the data or to make the data available to these coders? Were there, uh, were there people in Indonesia and, and Myanmar who were going through these PDFs? I just the specifics of how you actually extracted this data to make it useful. Sure. Um, I actually think maybe I'll ask Johan to comment as well because he we have actually worked on both of these projects, but let me give my notes. Um, Indonesia was quite a challenge because as I said, there were over 30,000 candidates. So it was a monumental effort to extract all of those PDF documents, all the data and get them into a format that we could uh, you know, call structured and, and, and uh, machine readable. What we used uh, for that instance was first uh, machines to crawl the election commission's website and access all of the pdf documents download everything that was public and available and then we use crowdsourcing to do the extraction using uh, i think people probably have heard of sama source it's one tool for crowdsourcing uh, which you can post a lot of your documents online and individuals in the developing world will transcribe them um, and we also used a private company called uh, Crowdflower. And uh, the turnaround was quite fast. And because of the algorithms that they employ and the way they do error checking, it was quite accurate. So we had a first batch uh, within a couple of weeks of getting started. All the data had been uh, transformed from PDF to uh, machine readable. Um, in Myanmar, and then we cleaned it up with various different other techniques. Uh, and then we still had errors because it's a, it's a process. It's an iterative process, right? Because people will eventually find an error and you just have to have a methodology for correcting it. Um, but in Myanmar, we had a special arrangement that we, uh, our field office in Yangon, our team there, uh, we all worked very hard for the last year to negotiate a relationship with the UEC and actually had a team uh, in Naypyi uh, working, a, a team that had worked quite regularly with the government on other IT projects help us do the uh, extraction. We had about, I don't know, 20 people. Would you like to 
pick up the story there because it was just a, a different approach, which. Yeah. Uh, so in Myanmar, uh, we end up with 60, more than 60,000 uh, paper document uh, registration form of the candidates. And then we build apps to entry uh, the data. So what we are do actually, we, we scan all the paper forms and we upload everything into application that we build. And then we hire uh, 20 s people to working with us in UIC office for around, I think two or three weeks. The way we do the, to cleaning the data is actually every paper need to input twice, minimum. So if the two input is, we compare these two inputs, if they are same, so it means the data is valid. If not, they need to take another input until at least we have two minimum uh, same data between th these two inputs. So, uh, so basically everyone just uh, open the browser, we show the scanned form on the left, and we put the uh, input form on the right. So basically they just need to input everything they show on the screen. And people never know like, are they really, uh, this the first input or the second input? So they just need input to everything they show in the screen. And the one of challenges that we have also, uh, actually we need the photos of the candidates in the paper form. So what we are doing is uh, we do, we build a script using, there's a tool, open source tool, uh, open CV. It's actually uh, image, uh, library to to do some image manipulation. So we do face recognition in the paper form that we scan to find where the photos actually, and then we we crop based on the face uh, that we found in the in the paper scan. Uh, we we found that some of the photos actually uh, cropped not perfectly, like a wrong position or something, but most of the photos we 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 got uh, all the photos in the paper form. So, yeah. Uh, then we extract everything in our database, and then we put into our uh, CSV file, and we also put everything on GitHub. So uh, every time people get problem with our data, for example, uh, they found error in the data that they have in our apps, they can just report to us in our GitHub or even in our Slack. You know, it's, I think it's, uh, there are always going to be errors and you have to build a method and a process that is aware of that. But you know, the error checking, in, in Yangon, for, in Napida, for example, we had originally planned a, and built an app that only took into account the form that we had seen when we first began planning this initiative, which was, uh, I think we had one page, uh, and then when we actually get the forms back from candidates, we the, well, the, the form has changed, right? So now there's two pages. So we have to kind of also re-envision the ingest process. And it's so, again, building to be flexible and iterative as you go through this because it's going to, it's unexplored territory as you go through it. You just have to have built in enough flexibility to modify your approach. It's never exactly right. There's still some errors in the database. We someone doesn't have a picture, someone's name is spelled wrong. So you know we have a system for correcting it. Uh, Laura Krieger from the Manoff Group. Um, going back to your initial list of some of the areas of development, sometimes in some areas of development we want people to understand a process and to be able to interact with that process. I'm thinking of one of the areas that actually wasn't on the list, which is the environment and climate change, for example. And so we may want policymakers to understand the consequences of implementing or not developing a policy to do something, or and even school children to understand the consequences and, and ways of preventing climate change. In order to do that, I think one of the best effective ways is through gaming. Are there people you work with who are interested in gaming? Um, in Indonesia, we actually not build only apps that showing the candidates. 
uh, because we understand some uh, I think especially also in Myanmar uh, in Indonesia we got 40% is the new voters the first time voters so we need to educate them how actually the voting do so some uh, especially in our first hackathon uh, in Bandung we famous with um, a lot of game studios we have in Bandung so some people build games to educate people about how actually the voting process happened for example uh, probably you guys understand uh, cooking mama games like uh, there's a restaurant that customer coming and then you need to assign like uh, the waiter to to serve them so there's a game studio in Bandung built like a uh, polling station simulation so when the photos coming they need to go to this area to register themselves and they need to move also to this to get the paper to vote and then get into the voting ballot and then uh, like uh, put their finger into the ink uh, so they uh, mark already uh, voted so uh, a lot of people understand that uh, games actually it's a fun way to educate people especially for young people uh, because we cannot rely only on information like uh, showing them and they they actually not interest because it's too formal for them so uh, in 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 Myanmar even we we build some kind of a simulation so maybe Linang can explain a bit so uh I think in the in the, tech the first runner apps uh, application, uh, they put this uh, something like a game uh, on the on the applications that uh, it shows the uh, the actual the ballot the voting uh, the the ballot that the people have to um, put a stamp on them and then they let the people uh, stamp it on the in the on their uh, phone screen so that what they did is actually eligible vote or ineligible vote so they can do this kind of simulation. And also, they can also kind of like uh, they show us like samples of the the ballot, and then sh and let the people choose whether this is eligible or is ineligible. This is kind of very simple and very intuitive uh, kind of thing game gaming stuff. So yeah, I think the not only people do the showing the just showing the information, but they also do the interesting stuff like uh, this kind of stuff. And yeah, I think people really like it. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Walter. Um, I work for a company, a development firm called Nathan Associates, and we're actually working pretty closely with with some of the ICT community in in Myanmar through PanVR. Uh, and one of the, th you know, I'm I'm especially fascinated um, both by the uh, human development potential that that the ICT community um, brings, as well as the economic growth potential um, that it brings. And in particular, perhaps cross-border potential, and maybe especially so with the uh, the so-called um, micro multinational uh, segment. Um, I, but I'm also interested, uh, from a legal and regulatory perspective, some of with some of both the obstacles and the opportunities that the ICT community presents, um, having to do with you know issues of privacy, electronic transactions, and especially in Myanmar right now, mobile payments. Uh, those sorts of things. I'm wondering if, you know, I'd love to hear from all three of you or any of you on, on some of your thoughts on, on the obstacles and opportunities that the legal and regulatory environment presents, particularly in the, in the ASEAN community uh, that you're working within. Uh, so right now, uh, as far as I can see, is that uh, the startups in our countries are mostly are the agencies that they do the work for the other business and some very few companies do the uh, direct uh, working directly with the uh, the general public but most of the uh, mine companies uh, we have we do the uh, some sort of uh, consumer facing applications uh, such as like uh, one of the apps we do is uh, called Yoshin uh, which shows the uh, what's really showing in the cinemas and then but right but we face a lot of difficulties difficulties when we try to sell the ticket online the, the cinema's ticket online because 
we don't have the concrete uh, payment system because uh, we don't have the uh, kind of uh, the, the, the major banks in the our country as they try to roll out their own solution uh, rather than working together. So we don't have the kind of the union kind of stuff. But uh, so we it's a very, very difficult process. And another thing is that uh, we are trying to understand the people. Uh, we d we sometimes we really have this kind of uh, wrong uh, perception is that we try to use a modern technology is a very very cool initiative uh, like Silicon Valley's company do but those kind of stuff doesn't work in our country because people don't really understand like uh, y you tap 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 and and then they they don't know how to go back to the the back previous screen and they don't know how to exit from these uh, kind of applications so we make a lot of mistakes in our very first in the early days in, uh, and and then we try to see in the real world how people use our apps and then they and then we we find we found a lot of problems with our application so we, we try to fix this in a kind of stuff so and another thing is that uh right now is that uh the two major and uh, dominant in our industry is that the people most people use uh, the facebook and then the another thing is that the messaging applications like WhatsApp or Viber or WeChat or Line. So th especially the messaging, uh, the thing is uh, very competitive. The a lot of uh, companies from foreign are trying to uh, get into the gan uh, into the country by uh, cooperating with the telcos, and they they put a lot they put a lot of advertisement and and try to get the uh, market share of the stuff. And they on the other side, the Facebook and people do a lot of almost everything on the Facebook, they sell stuff and they do a they do communities and they make uh then they do a lot of interesting stuff on the Facebook. So uh even the, the first Fuena apps is uh they do their app is kind of very similar to the Facebook applications and the very so that people understand the application very easily. Like they don't have to go to the detail by full f uh, after the two or three screen they can just swipe left to right. And then it's a kind of uh, Facebook application, uh, but it's very easy to use, and so a lot, a lot of people uh, seem interesting. So there are a lot of opportunities as well, but uh, because because the the more we s we see, the because there are lots of problems, and then the problems are the opportunities that we, we can see uh, we can see in that way. But the thing is that we have a lot very limited resource of uh, talents and the capacities and the fannings and stuff like that. So right now, s uh, s uh, somewhat most of the companies in our country are try uh, struggling with the survival because they're trying to, because they cannot monetize the applications and so they have to do the uh, customer walks and the service walks and stuff like that. But uh, eventually we will get there because uh, it's a kind of uh, the environmental uh, things because we cannot walk uh, alone because also the government in the meantime has to support with the policies and the concrete laws that covering the tech industry and the stuff like that. So, so we are we're looking we are really looking forward to it. Yeah, and we hope that things will be better. Yeah. Hi, Dominic Malone from Freedom House. Um, I'm wondering if you've been able to take any measurement of voter turnout as a result of your uh, app, uh, what kind of increase you've had in first-time voters, marginalized groups, opposition party people, that kind of thing, to get a sense of what impact your apps are having on voter turnout? Uh, we never set the challenge for developers to answer that, actually. But if we want, we can actually make additional challenge for developers to give us those kind of insights. For example, if we can give them like a give us insight about those kind of things, the developers probably will build the apps integrate with the Facebook where the all the data actually like a location, age, gender and everything. And if they can build the apps integrate with Facebook they can just give us all the users they have. Or maybe we can just give uh, uh, rules for all developers. They need to build all the apps using the Facebook, integrate with the Facebook. So we get all the users that need to use the app, we can get 
the user's data so we can mapping the the users so it's it's very dependent in our needs so but for us uh, about the election I think uh, giving like a uh, access to the Facebook is kind of like a one effort for the users will make user also thinking should I log in if I need to log in it means like uh, another effort for users probably they will not use our app because I don't want to log in with my Facebook so our ro uh, target actually to make the information easy to access so we just not do those kind of things I think we uh, kind of trade away a little bit of the tracking by making it a little more friction free to get access to the information that we want people to have access to, but but we are able to track usage and to look at the number of API calls to our database, very very granular level, and to track the uh, number of instances in which people are connecting on a daily basis. So when we, we can actually see things like when the Minister of Information in Myanmar posts on his Facebook page about our apps, we can actually see the spikes and correlate them with you know, users, but because we, at least in recent instances, we've sort of not required logins or integration with Facebook and things of that nature. And by the way, even if we were integrating with Facebook, we wouldn't be able to get at the user data. It's really difficult to get through the Facebook API to extract that kind of information. So um, unless the user then goes and voluntarily agrees to release that information to developers. So there is these layers of complexity which create friction for people. And so our goal was not voter turnout, but voter information and access to information because when we visited the KPU's website in Indonesia, it was a little abstract, a little opaque, a little hard to navigate, not built for mobile. So if you had really tiny fingers, you could navigate all those drop-down menus and finally make your way to candidate lists so that was the problem we were trying to solve. And again, it's problem definition is really important. And that's kind of you know, how we laid it out for people as part of the app challenge while still trying to make the data available to anyone that wanted to access it. Up to work. Do we have, do we have a phone though before? Actually, this would be for the uh, gentleman there, and then I would have one quick one for Mr. Carr. Um, is this uh, effort going to result in more people in your two respective countries just simply using the uh, cell phone, the mobile device, uh, for searching for information about things they want to know about or, or act upon rather than just communications with family or friends or calling the local fish market or whatever it may be, um, but real information. And secondly, um, the title of the session uh, is uh, Achieving Digital G Goals, I think, uh, Development Goals, yeah. Is that derived uh, from um, the Millennium Challenge Goals in some way or other, or uh, I'm actually very interested in finding the source of digital development goals for my own purpose. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say that those are, and that's I think that's Asia Foundation language for us, I think, uh, trying to connect it to what we do, uh, but understanding that in order to advance our goals and objectives as an organization and to do it efficiently in an age of uh, do more with less, do it faster, do it at scale, that you have to integrate these tools into uh, the work that you do as an organization, whether it's, there I think there are 17 current uh, new development goals that are out there and they're all focusing on, in, on environmental issues, access to uh, education, women. But yeah, for the Asia Foundation, um, we have our own set of initiatives and our own focus, which is again on women's empowerment, economic policy reform, governance and law, whole range of different, so that's, that's it. I think that's why we put it in there.
I think in Indonesia everyone uh, spend their time with their phone at least four hours a day and they use everything uh, especially for social media uh, we do everything in our phone buy stuff selling stuff chat with friends everything I think people interact with their phone so probably people in Indonesia doesn't get doesn't have uh, their PC or laptops but mostly they will have their phones especially in the big cities so that's why we rely on the mobile phone to push the information maybe one last question I guess or two or three maybe maybe three questions and then we're out Thank you. My name is uh, Kiriakos Kuparis. I'm with the U.S. Agency for International Development. I want to thank the panel for a great discussion so far. Uh, I think you all have mentioned at some point in your comments that brain drain is a big issue for Indonesia and Myanmar, perhaps generally in the region. In your opinion, what do you think needs to be done to reverse this brain drain, and is there a role that the international community can play in this effort? Thank you. So, so a lot of people in our country they want to uh, they want to Singapore and work there, especially for the tech industry. And they work in our country for a few years after they graduate. And then, after like a three or four years, they they go to Singapore, especially, and they work at the some of the companies there because of the pay is great and stuff like that. Uh, but now today, we see the trend is like kind of reversing. Some people come back to our country and start their own business or work as the, uh, some of the local or some of the international companies in our country because the, the pay is, is, uh, is the, the income is uh, kind of getting higher uh, as per standard. But the thing is that uh, still people are still going out to the other country and uh, working in the other country. But we really cannot blame them because uh, they, need, uh, they need more money to make their life easier and they need to support their families. And, and there are not a lot of, lot of uh, opportunities in our own country that can provide that kind of salary that they can get in Singapore and stuff like that. So, but so to my, uh, in my opinion, is that we need to improve as uh, the whole industry. We need to have the companies uh, with the with the better incomes or uh, with the more funding to afford the uh, like about the uh, like half of the salaries that companies are for in Singapore and stuff like that. And then in the meantime, people ho people also have to be upgrade their themselves to earn the uh, that kind of salary because uh, there's a kind of we need to work on the both side of the stuff and the one is the employer and the employee and then if someone is really good and w and then there are companies that who don't mind paying the same salary as the outside but the thing is that there are not a lot of people and so this is a they need to meet each other and uh, meet their necessary and the requirements so yeah, there, there. So, the also another thing is that the companies coming from the like Japan or stuff like they come, they come to our country and they pick the top talent because they can afford to pay like five times salary of the local companies. But uh, we also in the meantime kind of really blame them because it's also kind of our uh, industry is a kind of weak that we cannot match their pay and stuff like that. So we ourselves have to be developed in the first. And then we have to see how things go, and yeah. I had a few questions around working with um, government. Firstly, was all of the information you used to be out already publicly available, or, or were you uh, were you filling in gaps along the way? Um, and um, how um, how did uh, Asia? I understand Asia Foundation sort of brokered that relationship. It'd, it'd be good to have a little bit more information on on how you went about brokering that relationship with government and between developers. And um, the, how dependent of this is, is getting the government on board? And, and what do you feel that the government gets out of it? Did they have say over the apps? Did they, did they, were they able to input into the shape of the project? Um, and then lastly, uh, do you have any plans to go beyond election um, uh, uh, information uh, to other so sorts of uh, government information? Uh, in Indonesia, we have the data already uh, in the website, but it's in PDF file, which is for developers very hard 
to extract and use in their apps. But in Myanmar, uh, there's no data because the data is in paper. So we in Asia Foundation need to digitize the data and serve the data uh, for the developers. But uh, from my perspective, it is, it's very dependent on what kind of a problem we're trying to solve if we want to work with the government. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes we need to pull ourselves back because if we involve uh, the government in the first, sometimes they trying to they demand a lot of things, which is make us uh, lost our focus. So uh, previously, I work uh, I helping my 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 city in in Bandung. So I, I actually uh, kind of a like a smart city council. So we have a council for for uh, preparing our city for smart city. When I work with the government there, it's it's better to work on instead of involve them in the first, because they they have a different perspective, they have a different mindset when they think as a government, and we as a developer or we are as a software engineer. Usually, they they follow a lot of things, they think a lot of uh, obstacles, but for us, we trying to be practical. So for us, it's better to build the solution first and bring them in later after we prove that the solution is works or not, instead of involve them in the first. But if we're talking about the election, for sure we need to work with them in the beginning because uh, election is it's kind of like a short-term thing, not especially about uh, giving information to the voters. So in Indonesia, uh, we, we approach them uh, directly to, to help us get the data, but maybe because they not have a resource to give us the, the real data that we need, the structured data, so we just grab the data uh, from the website and turn into our database. But a week after our hackathon actually, then they built uh, their own API which is make us uh, easier to access the data. But in Myanmar, I think we had first different way because there's no data that we can access. So we help the election commission to turn the data into structured database. Um, just on the issue of Asia Foundation and the relationship building between uh, government and private sector, I think that's a role where Trusted international organizations can perhaps step in and help uh, serve as an honest broker. I think that's what the Asia Foundation tries to do across the region. We have 18 offices in Asia. Asia, we've been in the region for 61 years, and so uh, you know we've we've got networks and relationships that we call upon to connect with leadership in in the countries where we work. But I think we also have uh, the trust of the countries, the, the citizens and the governments. Uh, and also we have a track record, I think. We've been able to demonstrate um, you know, the kind of quality work that the foundation has done over the decades is, is, is noted. So, uh, and we were able to take the Indonesia story to the Union Election Commission in Myanmar and explain how we would work and how we would collaborate. And they, over many months of conversations, were open to the idea of experimenting. They're very interested in the new opportunities to share information online uh, because of this mobile revolution that we're sort of living through. And they see that as an opportunity to do uh, you know, e-government solutions in a way that actually work. So for the Asia Foundation, I, I think we've given the impression that maybe all we do is elections, but that's not the case. We work on a whole range of different issues as far as data, topics go and the kind of work that we're doing that we're trying to describe here. We've done work on urban service issues, uh, identifying urban service problems in places like Mongolia, working with migrant workers in, in Nepal who are going into host countries where they may not have good access to information on, the r on their rights and on how to be safe and what to do if they have a problem. Um, we've done work on disaster risk management data. We're doing a project in, in Thailand now to help, you know, uh, upgrade the alert system so that uh, the uh, government can push alerts to people 
across a whole range of different platforms rather than just do it via SMS. So it's, it's a, a variety of different things, environment projects, women's projects. I'm happy to talk at length about any, any of those projects at any time. So. Okay. Um, last question. Yeah, I can do the last one. <laughs> um, my name is Jana Hertz. I'm from RTI International, and uh, thank you for your presentations. I was particularly interested in um, the audience that you received with Pa'ahok in Dekai Jakarta and with President Jokowi at the national level. Um, what, uh, what do you think their response is in terms of using applications to combine government data with citizen feedback to address public policy issues? So I know that um, Ahok is interested in procurement reform, for example, and Pa Jokowi is very interested in tracking, for example, the use of the Dana Desa, the village funds. Um, are you involved in those, or what? when you met with them, what were they interested in, and how did they see the use of technology to address some of those issues? Uh, officially, I'm not part of the things. Like, uh, I'm not part of the committee uh, of the Hack Jack, the Hackathon Challenge from Jakarta, or also uh, the Hackathon Merdeka from uh, the s national level. But uh, I'm helping the... All these things happen actually uh, by the community. So, and also I'm part of the community, so I know everything that happening there. Because every time they trying to go to Bandung to bring developers involved in this movement, usually we uh, we trying to help them to uh, encourage developers to involve in this movement. But uh, what I'm thinking is, uh, from my self perspective, is. Uh, Jokowi may be very interested to work uh, with the developers because uh, they know that technology is uh, one of the uh, easiest way to solve things, but maybe not the big thing. At least we can, like uh, like I said, we can generate more data, e uh, easier to, to mon monitor everything. Uh, for example, in Bandung we have um, price monitoring monitoring app that every day uh, people we go to the market and check the price of uh, like a uh, like rice uh, tomatoes and everything in the market uh, in traditional market and then we publish through the app so everyone will know like uh, oh these prices will be like this every day S uh, from from Ahok I, I I'm not also understand what actually uh, their big vision but because I I always like help them to bring the developers into the hackathon, not internally uh, sit together with the committee to to work with them. So yeah. Okay, well thank you all for coming and thank you to our guests, for to Johan and Ye Lenong for coming so far to talk to us about something so exciting. Um, thanks to our guests also. Uh, Again, I'm with the Asia Foundation in San Francisco. Please be in touch if you would like to follow up on any of these issues that we've talked about. We do live stream this event, but we're also um, hosting the content on our webpage, which is www.asiafoundation.org. You can follow us on Twitter at Asia underscore foundation um, on Twitter. And uh, please come to more events that we host here in, in, the, in the building. We're always happy to have have you all. Thank you. <laughs>